Well, welcome to church today as we uh, get to spend this time together. I really hope that you're encouraged by what I'm going to share today. And I hope that there's some lessons, very practical lessons in it that are really going to help you to live the life that you want to live. This whole year, we're talking about getting our lives in order, about setting the priorities in place that must come first so that ultimately our lives they produce the fruit that we really want them to produce. And I think there's a big problem in kind of humanity today in that the reason that we're not doing the lives that we're supposed to is because we actually have them out of order in a sense of our priorities are out of order, in a sense of what we value is out of order, but oftentimes our hearts are out of order as well. So when we talk about the life you ordered, it's about us choosing to let Christ order our lives in the way that ultimately works. Jesus kept talking to us, and I've mentioned that over the last two times I've spoken, about how when Jesus gives us the advice about living, when he calls us to him, it's so that our lives become easier, in a sense, because we're doing things that ultimately work. Now, that means that our production grows and our happiness grows and the glory that we bring to God ultimately grows. And today I'm going to be talking about why what is first matters. Or I'll be talking about how first things must come first. I don't know about you, but I, I think my entire childhood was uh, a long, long lesson on doing what's important first before I went and did the fun thing or did the thing that really was silly. Like there were so many times in my life that I think that if I didn't put the first thing first, then other things didn't write. Like, like it's like, didn't you check if there was petrol in the car? Because having petrol in the car is a priority. It's, it's got to come first or you're not going to be able to drive. You know, going to the toilet before you get in the car. You know, because otherwise 10 minutes down the road, the trip's over. Because what is first really matters. And I've learned, and I want to share with you a very important principle about how the first thing matters a lot more than you think. And I want to talk about how God is actually calling us to put him first and his ways first and to prioritize him first so that the rest of our lives are ordered. Now, I want to tell you a little story. Um, years ago, I'm talking probably 18 years ago, 17 years ago, um, Jody and I had been, we'd, we'd, no, we'd bought a house and uh, you know, before that and renovated it and made a good profit off of that. As we sold to become pastors of this church and we had to move, we, we thought, well, let's do that again. We bought another house that needed a lot of work and we were renovating it. And in our hearts, we, we, always, we always wanted to be more free with money. We want to be able to give more and we wanted to be able to really bless the church and the community. And so we were actually looking into... Um, sort of buying and renovating houses in order to make a profit so that we could, you know, provide for our family, but also to be a blessing. So one day I'm out running and I'm running up this really, really steep hill. And um, as I'm running up this hill one day, uh, I noticed there was um, a nail set. I don't, you know, not that significant. If you don't know what that means, it's just a little thing that you knock on the head of a nail to knock it beneath the surface so that you can finish it up really nice. Anyway, I found this nail set there when I was running. I thought, oh, that's a great, that's a great blessing. And so I popped it in my pocket and I ran and, and then it turned out I needed it even the next day. I thought, oh, God, you really are taking care of me, aren't you? And the next day I'm running up that road and there's a pile of broken glass in the same spot. And I just ran past that thinking, oh boy, who's this scoundrel, just broken glass. And I felt like the Lord said to me after I'd run quite a while, he said, go back and clean that glass up. Why are you leaving that there? So I ignored him for a while, but then I just thought, no, he wants me to clean it up. So I went, I ran back, I cleaned up the glass, and I had to carry it in my hands as I'm running and found, until I found a bin. And then the next day, I'm running up there, and there's a $5 note sitting right where I just picked up that glass. And I thought, well, that's so strange. But I thought, well, maybe this is God giving me a, a payday for my glass cleanup exercise. Oh, you know, a bit of, uh, you know, carrot and stick, you know, a bit of reward on my good behavior. Sure thing. So I picked it up. As soon as I picked it up, I felt like God said to me, give it away. I thought, give it away. Okay. So the next, the very next person I saw, I just gave it to him. I don't know their circumstance, whatever. It didn't matter. I was just supposed to give it away. I gave it away. The next day, I'm running up the same spot. And there is a small unit for sale right at that spot. It, it, the sign had gone up that day. And I thought, that's really strange. And we're thinking about buying houses and renovating them. So I thought, 
I think I'm supposed to buy that house. I've been on a little journey of lessons of following God's leading, and I thought I'm going to buy that house. So Jody and I talked about it. I thought it worked great. So we bought that unit, and it ended up getting it quite a bit cheaper because of a bunch of circumstances. And I thought, this is really, really good. And the, from the moment that we started that project, we felt that God was saying to us, this is the first house of many. This is the first one you're going to renovate for a profit. This is the first, the first time you are going to make money and income from this calling or this vocation. And so I felt that what we needed to do was we needed to give half of everything we earned from that project to the Lord. Because I thought this is the first thing. And the first thing is really important. The, the very first house we do has, has got to be with showing the full intention of what, we're, what we are planning. And, and we wanted to honor God first with our first thing. So we did. We bought the house. We renovated it. We sold it. It took about three or four months. And we made a good profit. And I gave half the profit to the Lord. And then you, would you, you are going to know this for true. Every single house that we bought after that was always blessed. It was always blessed. Other people were having troubles, and, but everything we did, even though it was hard, there's difficulties, it was always blessed in the end. And I think it's so important because when we do what is first according to God's design, then the rest ends up blessed. I think one way we can express this is imagine that your life is like the solar system where there's the sun at the center, and then all the planets. Well, the planets don't just do their own thing. The planets all, they go around and around the sun. The, it's because the sun is so important, it's so large, and so massive, and has so much gravity, that it actually allows the planets to do their thing. And if, imagine that if you took one of the planets, perhaps Earth, which, by the way, people for a very long time thought was the center of the solar system. But the earth is just not big enough to support the weight of the sun going around it. And imagine if all of the planets had to go around this tiny, in comparison, earth is so much smaller. It just doesn't make sense for the things that are not as important to become the, the center of the, of the solar system or the center of life. And I think one of the things that happens to us is when we make other things the center of our lives, it, it throws the balance off of all the rest. And the center of every single life needs to be God. It needs to be God. Otherwise, it becomes this push-pull of, you know, I want this thing, I want that thing, I'm chasing this dream, I'm going after those goals. And right now, so many people think about their own lives as the most important thing happening. But it's not, it's not true. And in fact, your life will never make sense until God is at the center. And then you will find that orbit around him where he's the priority. But he gives order to your life because you... You walk in that place where it's your sweet spot. The universe is for God's glory, and we are a small part of God's divine plan. You know, in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 to 22, God says that people's lives become disordered when they stop putting God first. In Romans chapter 1, he says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darking, darkened, claiming to be wise. They became fools. You see, God says, as soon as you leave me as the center, like as soon as I stop being the center of your life and of life itself, and you start thinking it's all about this or all about me, even though you know that God is so much greater than you, when you do that, you actually end up becoming foolish. It's like something happens in your heart and your mind, and you can't tell what's important. So even when you make choices, they are foolish choices. And the solution then is to go back and put God first in your life. Because what is first matters. I want to tell you this little story of Abraham. You know, Abraham, when he finally follows God's calling to the promised land that he has been called out of Ur to go to, 
He, he enters that land. He takes his family with him. So he says, this, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 4 to 6, he says, Abraham went, and the, as the Lord had told him, and, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, which is north of Canaan. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions, and all that they gathered, and all the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And when they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land uh, to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So Abraham enters this brand new situation. He's never been here before. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He's got all of these people depending on him to make good choices. He's, the, the consequences of failure are high. And there's lots of other people around him that are ready and willing to take advantage of him blowing it. So what does Abraham do first? Well, I think this is really telling. Because it says, it says, the, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I'm going to give this land. And so he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there, he moved to the hill country to the east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on its west and A on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord. Do you see how Abraham recognized that in order for my life to work and the impact on that of everyone on everyone else, I've got to put God first. So in the new land, the very first thing he does is build an altar to God. They haven't even settled. They haven't even built houses. They haven't even planted land. They haven't grown their crops. They don't, they'd, all these other things that you would think are the priority, the food, the shelter, the clothing. No, Abraham says, no, 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 no. God is first. And because he put God first, God continued to bless him. And all those people he cared so much about, they shared in that blessing with him. And don't, even one time when his, his uh, son, or sorry, his uh, nephew, Lot, was captured because he had lived in an area that he probably shouldn't have lived. And he ended up getting carted off when, a, when another king, another army came and took, captive, uh, took captives in that land. Well, Abraham took his own people, made an army of them, and he chased after him. And he won this giant battle, defeating five kings. It was incredible. But, of course, God was blessing him. But then, of course, as, as soon as he wins the victory and he comes back, well, the, 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 there was a picture of Jesus where Melchizedek, the priest king, he comes and he... He, he blesses Abraham, and Abraham has a moment where God's representative is there. Well, it says here in Genesis 14, he says, he blessed him, and he said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemy out of your hand. And then it says, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. You see, Abraham got this moment where he could find, there was a priority there was a person, a representative of God there. And he said, I get this moment where I can give God a tenth of everything I've just acquired. All the loot, all the treasures, all of these things from these giant armies. He gives a tenth of it to God. Because he knows that the tenth, the first tenth, the first battle, the first day, the first everything. It's so important to prioritize God you know, and then there's this time where Abraham is probably getting his life out of balance. And that happens, doesn't it? Because Abraham has spent his whole early life longing for a son, someone to inherit him, to inherit his blessing, to inherit his fortune, to inherit his lineage. And he's wanted this, this son for so long. And that son becomes an obsession. In a sense, the, the desire to have a child takes over that central place in the solar system. And so God has to challenge him. God has to correct him. And so it says in Genesis chapter 22, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. And there offer him, and offer him there as a burnt offering to the, on one of the mountains, which I should tell you. So Abraham is called to make a choice. Is it going to be Isaac or is it going to be me? Are you going to do what you love? Are you going to love some, something on earth more than you love God? What I love about Abraham is he just says, okay, he's going to do it. He's going to trust God 
Because they actually believed that even if he sacrificed his son, that God would just bring him back from the dead because God had promised him a son. His faith was great. But God corrects his priorities and helps his heart. I hope that today, what you're going to experience is God's loving correction. That God, when he tells you, put me first, it's not a selfish thing. God doesn't need your worship. He doesn't need your money. You need God. You need to worship God. You need to devote your, yourself to God. You need to give God the tenth of your money. Because that's what's good for, for you and for your family and for all of the people in your life that you love. You know, there is an order in life. I've oftentimes thought it in these ways. God is absolutely first. He has to be first in everything. And second to God is your spouse. The person that God has called alongside you, who has become flesh of your flesh, bone of your bone. They have become part of you. If you don't take care of them, then you're not going to be a good parent. And that's why kids always come after your spouse. In fact, if you don't put God first, you'll never be a good spouse because you'll always get pulled off in other directions. And you, if you love your wife, your husband more than you love God, then you are actually doing them a disservice because you will do things for them that shouldn't be done or you will act in ways that aren't going to help that person that you say you love. It's always God, then spouse, then kids, because if you don't love your spouse and devote yourself to your spouse, then you're not going to be a good parent and the family unit won't be a strong unit. It's a priority and a blessing to your children to love your spouse more than your kids. So you see how the order works? And then, of course, after that, it's your vocation. Because if you love your career, you love the thing you're called to, you love the talent thing that you do, and you make that more important than your kids, then your kids aren't going to prosper. And your wife or your husband isn't going to prosper. And you see, what God does is because if God is first, then he can tell you if your vocation is hurting the other things in your life, he can give you orders about what to do about it, and then you will live in order. And then finally, after that, it's your spiritual family, it's your church, it's the people that God has called you in a life journey together in service to him. And I've seen so many people, pastors and friends of mine, who have got the order wrong. Sometimes they're so devoted to their calling or, or to the church that their wives and their children suffer. But that's not right. And ultimately, it means that they can't do their ministry. You see, God puts things in order so that things work. And he lovingly corrects us. You know, God is always thinking about what is coming. In 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, we see uh, uh, that same setting, that same mountain that, that Abraham went and prioritized his, his uh, God at when he was offering up Isaac. Well, so at that same place, in 2 Chronicles 3, 1, it says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. That's the same place that, that Abraham was called to build an altar to God and sacrifice his son. Now, then it says the Lord, because that's where the Lord appeared to David, his father, at the place where David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. You see, if Abraham hadn't gotten the priorities right, then down the line, his great, 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 let's many greats, sons, David and Solomon, wouldn't have had this opportunity to lead the community in worship to God. These things matter. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 to 12, when God talks about putting order in our lives, he says this, in, uh, he says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your produce. And then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bur bursting with wine. God's saying, put me first and these other things will get my blessing. You put those things first, it's all you, it's all your work. But then look at the response second to that. He says, my son, don't despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. You know, see, when God corrects us about the priorities and what's first in our lives, he does it as a loving father. But you and I know that a loving father sometimes disciplines painfully his children. He doesn't do it because he likes to hurt their children or to see those children in any kind of emotional or physical pain. But a loving father makes sure the children learn the lesson. And God has established an order in the universe. It would be an unfaithful father, an unfaithful God who didn't correct us. 
And so if, if you're feeling the challenge of, hey, is God first? Is God first in my time? Is God first in my money? Is God first in my agenda? Is God first in the one I honor, the one I obey? You see, my priority, if he's not, then God is lovingly rebuking you right now. And he's saying, do this because I want your life to be blessed. It is a loving God who gives us these kinds of directions. And in fact, Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the priority of these things. When he talks about children obeying their parents, as I said, children need to submit to their parents. So children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Then he quotes the command, honor your father and mother. It's the first of the commandments with the promise. What's that promise? That it'll go well with you and you may live long in the land. You see, children are, are told, honor your parents. Not so that you're just kind of putting up with this person, but so that God's blessing is on your life despite the character of your parents. When they get it right, that's a blessing. If they're not getting it right, you still so honor because God is the one who brings the blessing to our lives. Here's a principle. This is dependable. You can rely on this because this will work for you at every time. If the first, then the rest. Romans chapter 11 verse 16 says, if the dough offered as the first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. This is why the first matters so much. Because God is saying, if you devote the first of everything to me, if I am first and you devote the first to me, then everything after that has my blessing. Because the first is holy, then the rest is holy. And we need to start thinking about our lives as the beginning of a branch. Our lives are growing. Our generational families are coming from it. Our, uh, the blessing that we reach out in the community is there's a starting point. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Now that's talking about Jesus Christ. If you are part of Jesus Christ, if he is the root of your life, then the branch that is your life is blessed in Christ Jesus. But so also every decision that you make in Christ. If he's first, then you will be blessed. When we give everything to the Lord, it's really a recognition that everything comes from the Lord. In Exodus 13, 2, it says, Consecrate to me all of the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both man and beast, it's mine. See, when you say, God, you get the first, you get the best, you get the honor. When you do that, you're basically saying, you're the one who makes growth. You're the one who makes creativity. You're the one who brings me these good blessings. And so we give God the first unless it's unacceptable. Because we all know this. We hear about, you know, the first is the best. But what if that firstborn has got problems and it's not okay? What if it's not acceptable because let's call it seconds? You know, we say that all the time. We don't give God our seconds. It says in Leviticus 22, verse 20, you shall not offer anything that has a blemish, for it will not be acceptable for you. See, God doesn't want us to think, oh, give God your cast offs. You got a bit of loose change? Check it in. Oh, I've got a bit of spare time? Oh, well, I'll do something. Oh, I've got a few moments here. God is saying, don't treat me like seconds. And I won't accept your seconds. And see, that's the issue with us is that we are not holy to the Lord. And so God cannot accept us as those firsts. He must give his first. That's why in John chapter 3 verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, that that son, the word only son, means only begotten son, his firstborn. See, God gives his firstborn for us because he doesn't treat us as second rate. He treats us as his priority. You see, God gave his son Jesus to die for us so that we could have eternal life because we're not acceptable. Even if you are the firstborn, you're not acceptable. But God's firstborn is and so he gives his son so that we can become cleansed and holy through the death and resurrection of Jesus. You see, God takes what is first of his so that we can become first. In fact, it becomes a new generation of first. Look at Romans chapter 8 verses 29 to 30. Those that God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
And those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. You see, God has a plan for us, and God is taking us from being unacceptable to not just acceptable, but we become firstborns. We become like Jesus Christ, and we begin to live like him. So here is another principle found in Scripture. We've talked about how if the first, then the rest. But here's how it works. We order, and then God blesses. Or first the natural, then the spiritual. So 1 Corinthians 15, verses 4 to 6 says, it is not the spiritual that's first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. And a lot of people don't understand that. They think that God is somehow will organize or control or compel or tell But God is not going to usurp the authority that he gave you in your own life. He wants you to do your bit first, then he'll do his bit. And if you think, well, that's kind of not fair. I'm going to tell you, in the life story of Jesus Christ, it happens again and again and again. Take, for example, the healing of the man born blind. When the man is, is, you know, going to be healed... Jesus makes mud, it says, having said these things, he spat on the ground, made mud with his, the saliva, then he anointed the man's eyes with mud, and he said to him, be healed. No, he didn't. He said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And so he went and washed and came back seeing. You notice how Jesus calls him to action first before he sees his miracle. And in fact, again and again and again, you will find that Jesus is leaving the opportunities and the options of who he is up to you. He's got all the power and blessing, but if you don't come to him, you get none of them. If you don't come to him with faith, believing, then you don't receive. It's always our choice. In a sense, it's, it's a reflection of our desire for God. Is, is the question answered is, this is the most important. God, you are the most important to me. Because if it's not, then you don't do whatever he says. Take another example here when he, he's calling the first disciples and he's giving them a life lesson here. They'd fished all night and they were exhausted. But in Luke chapter 5, he says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out to the deep. Let you own your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night. We took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they'd done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. And see, Jesus could have just easily just called out all the fish of the ocean to just jump into their boats, and they would have to do nothing. But he doesn't. Do you notice that he doesn't do that? He actually says to them, do what I tell you, and then you'll see your blessing. We have to do what Christ is saying to us. Because if they had said, no, Lord, hey, if you want me to have lots of fish, just get them jump in the boat. No. If they'd said, no, Lord, we don't trust you. We're fishermen. You're not. You don't take advice from a carpenter to do a fisherman's job. But they don't. In fact, what they do is they do what Jesus tells them to do, and then they see their blessing. And so as we finish our message, this message today, And I've told you about how important the first things are. How prioritizing God actually brings blessing to the entire life. That I'm sure that you're feeling challenged right now about, is God first? Have I prioritized him? Does does my prioritizing of him show up in any way? Is he first in my, my time? Do you spend time with him in devotion first? Do you spend time in prayer with him first? When you're making decisions, do you talk to him first? When you're starting something new, do you honor him first? In your relationships at home and at work and at your friendships, is God first? With your money, is God first? Do you give the tenth, the tithe to God, which is his? Do you give it to him first? You see, there's so many places in our lives where God is challenging us, not so that we come under some legalistic structure, but it's a picture of our hearts of trust in God. It's a picture of our love for him. And God responds to that because he has commanded things to be that way. So put him first. If you, if you have not been being generous with God, with your time, in your honor, with your talents then I'm, I'm telling you, your life is out of order. And it's only going to hurt you and your children and your grandchildren 
It's not just going to hurt you. It's going to hurt your business. You see, God wants you to put first things first. And let me pray for you that God will give you spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you can honor Christ as Lord in everything in your world. So, Father, I pray for every person watching right now, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you would touch them and challenge them as a loving father. Lord, a, a father who wants to see people prosper, to see people blessed, to see people live a generational blessing. Lord, I pray that you challenge people right now and help them by your Spirit's power to walk in the way of Jesus, to follow Jesus. I pray, Father, for people who have not yet made Jesus Lord, that right now you would give them faith to receive Christ as Lord and Savior and make him their, their first, their prioritized, their, their God. Lord, I pray that you would bring people to Jesus right now. If that's you, reach out to him and put him first in your heart and life. God bless you. Thank you for joining us here today. We pray that you will live a life that benefits from the order that God has planned and desires for you. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.